The following program contains adult content and sexual themes. Viewer discretion is advised. And it contains murder. Lots and lots of murder. <laughs> Stinking bastard. People tell me, hey, you're gonna go die and go to hell. At least I'm not alone. Time for 911. Where's your emergency? Oh, this is Sandy. We're pretty one. Look, Black Clear Road. Send the police. Send the police. And he goes, don't be a hero, mate. And I said, I'm not trying to be a hero, but the police are coming. One in the chest, one in the head. Fired by Detective Sergeant Roger Rogerson. I was uh, branching out, that's when the cannibalism started, eating of the heart and uh, the arm muscle. Oh, oh we're now Carl Williams' hands for a coffee table with this and just pulled it out of his backside. Carl Williams is a wobbly bottom little cher cherub of face, cherub face little boy who would, who, who would, who, whose, whose life would be... I harm someone each time I kill someone, there'd be an enormous amount, uh, especially at first, an uh, enormous amount of horror, guilt, remorse afterwards, but then that impulse to do it again would come back even stronger. You know, Tara, this morning I dreamt of a cow with no legs in a puddle. Yeah, and? I don't know what it means. Maybe. Was I the cow or was I the puddle? I'm pretty sure you were probably the puddle. Was a cow unhappy, you ask? Um, <laughs> no, I didn't ask that, but was it? I don't know. It uh, moved. Okay, the cow with the legs that aren't there in a puddle moves. <laughs> Who knows what it means. Hey, um, I'm Barney Black. And I'm Tara Saraband. And we do Bloody Murder. We're a weekly true crime podcast focusing on some of the lesser known serial killers and crime stories from Australia. And indeed around the globe. What will you be covering this week, Barney? A tragic uh, series of events that led to the death of two lovely sisters by a hardened criminal. That's an Aussie one, isn't it? It is. All right, I'm heading to Scotland. I'm going to be talking about Scotland's biggest serial killer. His scary nickname is The Beast of Birkenshaw. Ugh. I know, almost as scary as The Beast of Birkenstocks. Hmm. Well, before we do that, um, let's talk about some listener feedback. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Well, on Twitter, J. Arthur Zudema said... Gotta say, I'm American and live in Norway. The accent they have on Vikings is very accurate. Um, we were discussing Norwegian accents a while back. Um, we were. When we were talking about the, was it the Ismail, Isdale? Isdale woman? The Isdale woman. And Barney was attempting his Norwegian accent to varying degrees of success, depending on who you talk to. Um, but he actually followed up this, this tweet by saying, the show is garbage though. And for a second, I thought he meant our show. Oh, bitch. And I was just like, I'm going to bitch slap you, Arthur. But then he said, Vikings, not your show. Your show rocks. And I was like, oh, phew, don't have to phew. cut a bitch. So thanks for that, J. Arthur. Hey, Jim DeGriz says, uh, my ex-wife just told me that she dislikes your podcast. By poxy, that makes you a favorite. Ha ha, in your face, ex-wife. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Louise Philly Peterson, um, actually, in a thread where we were talking about Barney's cat being stolen and possibly eaten by old ladies, um, people posted a lot of their pictures of their pets. And she said, I had a cat just like this. So she had many other homes just like yours, and she lived to the ripe old age of 18. She also loved to bring us gifts from the neighbor's laundry, gloves, socks, and undies. We called her the mighty hunter of inanimate objects. Um, apparently, she even bought them a bra once, which was very uh, embarrassing for Laura because she had to try and figure out whose bra it was by door knocking her neighbours and showing them underwear. I never did get that bra back. Oh, you don't wear a bra. You just let them hang loose. I like to free the Brunswick too. Yeah, you like some air on your hairy nips. Hey, uh, Lisa Finnegan. Well, is, yes. Is a great Irish name. <laughs> um, she's from Ireland and she says my Irish accent is A1. Um, oh, and, well, that's good to hear. Um, but she also pointed out that um, dacking people in Ireland is called jocking. Right, okay. So it's called dacking in Australia, jocking in Ireland, pantsing in America. Hmm. What do they call it in um, the Ukraine? Mm, bantlessness. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think we're going to collect words for that from all over the globe. 
and I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who reviewed us today, um, especially Miss Inky, um, and point out to our friend Riga, if she's listening, that that review that she gave us, <laughs> it, although the words are complimentary, you gave us one star, bitch. I don't think she meant to do that. Yeah, we're coming for you. We're coming for you, Riga. <laughs> you know when your friends give you a one star review, it's a little bit shitty, but we think that was a mistake. Hey, or maybe she's off the Christmas card list. Hey, Tara. Hey, Barney. I would like to thank our patrons. Absolutely. Sean M. Whelan. I'm pretty sure the M is for murder. Murder. Dial Sean for murder. Uh, Kelly, if it's on fire, I'll drink it, Bryden. Uh, David um, Dude Man Pants Laity. Yeah. Um, Jim, my ex-wife sucks. DeGrills. DeGrills? DeGrills, in fact. Sorry, Jim. Uh, the delightful manners are? Uh, Kin and Ten. Ten is his current body count. Ab hate. Ah, well, that one writes itself, doesn't it? Yeah. Don't uh, ha- don't hate your abs. Be no. of, be of the abs, not in the abs. <laughs> Paint the abs on if you don't have the abs. Um, and Frankie, I never met a cat I didn't like. Jay Asakara. And uh, the wonderful Holly Andrew. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, and if you would like to support us, visit our Podbean page and click on the Patron button. There are some sweet, sweet benefits to be had. Yes, in fact, we're finally putting some extra content up there. Yes, Um, by the time you hear this, there will be extra content. There will. We're going to record it after this episode, and I'm going to drink during it. Hooray! Uh, And you can find a link to that in our show notes. There's also a link to our merch store, our Threadless store, and we've got some new merchandise up, uh, a Travis the Chimp. Uh, design, which yes. you can have on a t-shirt and a mu- or a mug. I really like the Travis one. Uh, there's a Topsy the Elephant. Yep. And a um, Get Your Hands Off My Dirty Pillows design. Did you actually seriously make that into merch? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a joke. Yeah, you're alright with it, aren't you? You can get it on a doona cover on a shower curtain. You should get all of the things. A bath mat. Oh my god! Okay, I could get a shower curtain, a bath mat, a pillow, there's a tote, and a doona cover with a, my face. There's a tote bag you can get too, and I'm sure <laughs> I've, I've been told that you can fit an entire human head in it. Oh, as long as it's not Ron Perlman's. Oh no, you would need the you doona need, cover for that. <laughs> yeah, you can use a doona cover for that. Oh my god! So I could get all this merchandise with my own stupid head on it, and then like I could maybe pick up some random dude and invite him over, and he could freak out at my level of narcissism. <laughs> well, even more so. Yeah, even more so. I mean, all my walls are just mirrors. So mirrors with pictures of me on them, yeah? Uh, before you get started on this Scottish serial killer, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Deb and her new dog, Benji. <gasps> oh, yeah, that's Barney's neighbour and there's a new dog and I have to go meet it. Yeah, we have to go and pat it later. Hey, Deb. All right, let's hear about the Scottish. All righty. Um, so... Peter Thomas Anthony Manuel was born in New York on March 13, 1927, to Scottish parents who had moved to the US hoping for a better life. Things didn't really go according to plan, so they came back to the UK when he was five years old. By the age of 10, he was known to police for multiple petty thefts. He was in and out of remand homes over the next several years and often ran away from them to commit more crimes. Now, we actually have a clip of journalist Russell Galbraith, um, who covered Manuel's murders, talking about Manuel's youthful crimes. By the way, sometimes I call him Manuel because it's, it's because of Faulty Towers. What I'm trying to say is Manuel, because that is, in fact, his surname. Um, so here's the clip. The classic tale told of him as a boy, I think he was about 15. He was, wasn't old enough at the time for Borstal. He was in a remand home somewhere. He was always escaping. He made a record, I think, as an escaper. And uh, he turned up in some girl's bedroom, a night, night shift worker, and she awoke to find this boy battering her over the head with a hammer. With a hammer? Yes, battering her over the head. That has got to be one of the most unpleasant ways I can think of to wake up. Uh, fortunately, she survived that attack, though, so she is one of the lucky ones because this guy didn't like letting people be alive. Uh, at around 16, he turned his hand to violent sexual attacks and that resulted in him serving nine years in Peterhead Prison for rape. When he got out, he went straight back to his life of crime and was marked as a habitual offender by police. He was very arrogant and vain and like nothing more than to boast about what he perceived to be his superbly executed crimes. 
Uh, Manuel liked to play up his American ancestry as he was obsessed with being a gangster. Uh, he read American gangster books and watched all the gangster movies. He even tried to dress like a gangster in pinstripe suits and tried to speak in an American accent. Uh, he was a gangster wannabe dickweed, trying to be Jimmy Cagney. The only good thing about the guy is his hair. Everything else about him pretty much sucks. So his first confirmed murder happened over New Year in 1956. Mae McLaughlin and her sister were friends with their neighbour, 17-year-old Anne Neelands. And now we have a clip of Mae talking about the last time she saw Anne. Anne came in looking for my older sisters to see if they would like to go out. Anne just decided to stay for a wee while. Her dad didn't allow her to wear makeup, so she always put it on when she came into her house. She put her makeup on and decided just she wouldn't wait for my sister, she just decided to go down to the village. And that was the last we heard of her. The last I heard of her, eh? Yeah. Um, Anne Neelands um, went to a dance in nearby Blantar. She was walking home alone after midnight and took a shortcut through East Kilbride Golf Course, which is where she encountered Manuel. Uh, he attacked her ferociously and raped her before bludgeoning her to death with a length of iron, which caved in the top of her skull and actually scattered pieces of her brain everywhere. Like, it was really brutal. Uh, her body was found on the 4th of January 1956, which sent the whole community into a state of shock. I actually have another clip of May McLaughlin um, describing what Anne was like when she was alive, obviously. She was lovely. She was always smiling, really, really full of fun. And when this happened, we just, we were all devastated, just could not believe it. So sad. Yeah, yeah, I know. Such um, a delightful accent, I think, too. Yeah, I'm surprised you haven't uh, attempted it yet, but I, I guess there hasn't been the most opportune moment, huh? No. No. Respectful Barney. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he exists sometimes. Um, so the police actually found one of Anne's shoes near May McLaughlin's house, which made them theorise that um, she'd been running from Manuel trying to escape him. And we just, again, have a really brief clip of May... Um, basically talking about how sad it is that they weren't able to help her. That hurt terribly. We were so upset because we thought, was she running running towards our house for help and nobody heard her? Yeah, well, I mean, they did live nearby. That is probably exactly what she was doing. Yeah. Uh, so, Manuel was working for the gas board in the area at the time. Due to his epic criminal record, he was questioned by the police, but he wasn't actually detained due to a lack of evidence. Um, again, I've got Russell Galbraith, the journalist who investigated this case, describing what happened with that. And when they went to see him, his face was badly scratched. Now, he claimed those scratches were obtained in a street fight in Glasgow uh, during a holiday period. and. You know, that's quite possible, I suppose. But it, it's interesting to to think that nowadays DNA would easily, I imagine, have established he sustained the scratches from Anne Neelands. Well, uh, I don't think Scottish people in pubs scratch each other. Oh, I don't know. I was just going to say what a coincidence that he got scratched in the face in a bar fight at the same time that she got killed. I mean, those Scottish dudes, they don't punch each other or headbutt each other or glass each other. They just claw at each other's faces with their long fingernails, don't they? I don't believe that. No. Come on. I've seen train spotting. It's all about glassing people, right? No. <laughs> um, yeah, that's probably true. It isn't all about glassing people. It's just a little bit about glassing people. Um, so he wasn't charged with Anne's murder at the time because his father gave him an alibi saying that he was at home. Uh, it's strongly believed that his father also helped him destroy his bloodstained clothing. Manuel struck next on September 17th, 1956, in the quiet middle-class suburb of High Burnside in Glasgow. Manuel was out on bail after being arrested for a burglary at a colliery. What the fuck is a wee colliery? Um, it's a coal mine and the buildings and equipment associated with it. I knew that. Yeah, sure you did. Um, 16-year-old Vivian Watt had spent the afternoon shopping with a friend and returned home to listen to Radio Luxembourg with her mother, Marion, and her aunt, Margaret. Her father, William, was a master baker. <laughs> <laughs> master baker. Master baker? Yes. What did you think what I said? What the fuck are you calling my dar a master baker? <laughs> 
He was a master baker. He was such a good baker that he was, in fact, the master of baking. Wow, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, he also owned sh- several shops in Glasgow, and he'd gone 90 miles away on a bit of a fishing trip for a week. Uh, during his absence, Marion's sister was staying with them as she felt anxious being home alone. <sighs> Didn't really help, though, did it? <sighs> Sometime after they all went to bed, Manuel broke a pane of glass in the kitchen door and let himself in. Her mother and aunt, who were sharing a bed, were both killed quickly by being shot through the head. Uh. Mm. Vivian seems to have been the main target of his attack. This nasty prick has a taste for teenage girls. Um, He tore her clothes off, bashed her about the face, shot her in the head and ransacked her room because that's just what cool gangsters do. Uh, Vivian was still alive when Manuel left but died shortly after the crimes were discovered and an ambulance was called the next morning. So, yeah... (sighs) At the time, there were an average of 14 murders a year in the whole of Scotland, so to have a triple murder was unheard of, and of course it had a massive impact on the community as well. The police arrested William Watt for the murders, so that's um, Vivian's dad and Marion's um, husband. No, not Billy Watt. Yeah, Billy Watt. Um, In a really weak case, they charged that he had driven the 90 miles to Glasgow, killed his family, and then driven 90 miles back to his hotel all in the one night. Uh, They'd questioned workers at all the petrol stations along the way, but none could recall him filling up his car. However, there was a ferryman they spoke to who thought he had carried William Watts' car across the Clyde River on the night of the killings. Oh, don't pay the ferryman. I was going to say, don't... Until he gets you to the other side. Yeah, don't pay the ferryman until he doesn't dob you in for killing your fucking family. Yeah, don't play the theremin. Don't play the theremin. Do you still have your theremin? I do still have my theremin. How come I haven't seen you whip it out in a... Years. I play it every night. No, you don't. I do. Where is it? It's upstairs. I play it all the time. Do you play it in bed? Yeah. Do you play it and make love? No. Are you sure? I turn it off and then I make love. Ah, right. It's a likely story. Um, But anyway, because of Dickweed the Ferryman, uh, Watts was charged with the murders and sent to Barlini Prison on remand um, and he was actually kept in there for a couple of months. How yeah. fucked is that? Your whole family has been killed and then some dickweed ferryman's like, I think it was him. Um, mm. So, yeah, poor guy. Uh, a few days later, Manuel, who was also sentenced to Barlini Prison for the break-in uh, at the colliery, um, he, he went into the same prison. So, so what did he get from there? A few picks, a few shovels? Maybe uh, some coffee because there was probably an office. Hmm. I don't yeah. know. What do they have in a in a coal mine? Nothing I'm interested in, I don't oh, think. They'd have all those hats with the lights on them. Yeah, that would come in handy when stalking young women through golf courses, Absolutely. I well, you got use of both your hands. Yeah, but, I mean, wouldn't it sort of, like, jiggle around on your head when you're running? No, I don't think they've really fitted. It's been a while since I've worked in a coal mine. Yeah, I think that you should put on your coal mining helmet in your bedroom in the dark and play the fucking theremin, huh? How's that sound? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. while making love I, I had to my whomever you please. That's right. <laughs> I had my day playing the theremin. I used to wear my white suit, get up on stage and do it. You I, remember that? Remember those days? Um, oh, did you do it live as well? I, I know did. that I you used to do it when you, de- when you DJed. Uh, you used to do your theremin after No, no, I never did it DJing. I did it when I was when I played in people's bands. I've seen you do it DJing as well. Really? Yes. Yeah. In your old place. Anyway, um, we digress because that's what we do. Uh, profession, digressor. Professor digressor, that's me. Oh, digressy high. Yeah, yeah, digressy junior high, all the way with Stephanie Kay. Um, anyway, the most high-profile prisoner um, in Barlini Prison at the time was William Watt, which bothered narcissistic fuckhead Manuel because he wanted oh, 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 the attention. Uh, he actually made contact with Watt's solicitor and told him he had a lot of information about the murders. And journalist Russell Galbraith. See, this guy, he was on the scene. He was covering the shit. That's why I've got a fair bit of him describing things because he is in the know on this case. Um, So he's just, um, I've got a clip of him talking about Manuel's attention-seeking antics, of which there were many. He had a reputation, actually, for writing to Lanarkshire police and uh, telling them about all thing, all sorts of things that were going on in Lanarkshire and naming names and telling them who did it and sometimes describing things that he had done. Uh, there's no doubt that he he loved the limelight. He, he liked the idea of being the centre of attention. Well, like you, Tara. There's no doubt. 
But I like inserting myself into the spotlight of others. Um, Anyway, he was a narcissistic dickhead who indeed enjoyed doing that. Uh, He didn't actually care if the attention he got was good attention or bad attention because he's a goblin. Uh, He told what solicitor details of the Watts house that the solicitor thinks he couldn't have gotten from someone else. Though he said it was the person who killed them that told him this. You know, like, my friend killed them and told me. Um, So, yeah, I guess he told himself all about it because he's the one who killed them. What a hat full of arseholes. Yeah, yeah. Minus the hat, maybe. Yeah, yeah. It was just, just like, arseholes, un- unrestrained arseholes just bouncing. You know what that would sound like, a hat full of arseholes? Um, a little bit like Barney Black, I think. Oh, no. No, 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 no. That's uncalled for. Stop it. Oh, that's that was what, I, like, think. That's that's what th- I think it'd sound like. We're wearing headphones. It sounded like it was coming from inside my mind. If you ever want to drive me entirely insane, it's a really good well, starting I put, point. I put a hat full of assholes inside your mind. <laughs> <laughs> you are a hat full of assholes inside my mind. Um, so after what was released um, from prison due to lack of evidence, he went on a quest to try and find out who had murdered his family. He ventured into the Glasgow underworld to try to find information on where the gun used in the murders had come from. Uh, And after Manuel was freed at the end of November 1957, a meeting was organised between him and Watt, because Watt doesn't already have enough darkness and drama in his life. Um, Again, Russell Galbraith, the journalist, is going to tell us a little bit about this meeting. Here is William Watt, whose family has been murdered. He's been accused of the murders. He sat in prison. Public opinion was convinced they had done it. And in those days, people were executed it was a very, very chilling experience for him. And here he's sitting across a table from the guy whom he is convinced has done it, has killed his family, has put him in that dreadful, life-threatening position. And this fellow is trying to charm him with his knowledge of the case. Yeah. Oh, I know. He's essentially fucking with poor Watt, who's just had his whole family killed by him. Wow. Yeah, I know. Evil son of a bitch. He's such a narcissistic prick. Um, So, yeah, he gave him all these details and acted like, you know, he knew someone who knew all these things. Um, William Watt felt like, you know, it was definitely him that did it and said that he would tear him limb from limb if he found out he was involved. Must have been really hard for him to not just fucking glass the guy right then and there, right? Um, Manuel gave him, yeah, more details of the murders, pretending that he wanted to help. That was like the guys that he was coming in on. Just cheap and gross and nasty. Um, Anyway, on December 28th, 1957, 17-year-old Isabel Cook had a date with her boyfriend, Douglas Bryden, to go to a dance in Uddington. We've got a, a brief clip of Douglas Bryden describing Isabel. I met Isabel Cook at school, and I think it was the fourth year, and uh, she and I uh, appeared to click, and uh, we became very friendly. We used to uh, walk up to school together from from the train, and uh, she was a beautiful girl. Um, by common consent, she was the, the one of the top-looking girls in the school. I think you would call her a stutter nowadays. The arrangement was that I would meet her at such and such a time. It was on the main street in Uddingston and uh, we would go together to the dance. And she had these weird cracking titties. Yeah. All of the boys admired. <laughs> oh, that was Irish. <laughs> yeah, if you're not careful, you turn every accent into Irish. Yeah, at first I actually found that a little bit lame that he just kept banging on about how hot she was. Um, but then I told myself that when my high school girlfriend gets murdered, I'll have a chance to say absolutely everything right in the interview, won't well, I? it was 50 years later. He was remembering, and I think he was a, a sweet old man. Oh, she was a hot piece of ass. She was yes. a hot piece of ass. <laughs> no, he was a sweet old man, probably. Um, so Isabel never showed up for her date with Douglas, and she didn't come home that night either so her parents reported her missing the the very next morning Uh, the police found her underwear but there was no sign of her body and that's just that's never going to end well no um an extensive search for her took place across the whole of the uk but apart from a few items of her clothing they came up empty-handed on january 3rd 1958 a young boy named david perrette went to visit his friend michael smart Uh, he knocked on the door but nobody answered 
Michael was Doris and Peter Smart's only child and David Perrette was his bestie. Uh, they hung out together all the time. Peter Smart was the manager of a civil engineering firm and the family had been planning to go away to visit Doris's parents for the new year, but they changed their plans at the last minute and decided to celebrate New Year's Eve at home instead. The neighbours assumed that the Smarts had gone away on the trip, so they didn't think anything of not seeing him around, not seeing them around for several days. Hmm. So Manuel broke into their house in the middle of the night. Um, he shot each one of them in the head. Oh. Yeah, and after he murdered the Smarts, he actually hung around at their place on and off for the next several days, just like ignoring the dead bodies and eating all their food and drinking all their booze. And in a really surprising turn of events, he actually fed their cat. Wow. I know. Normally when I get to mention cats on the show, it's, because, dogs. it's because someone did something, you know, or chimps not or nice elephants. to them. Animals don't get a good run on this show. They really don't. So, yeah, Peter Manuel. What um, was the uh, cat's name? Uh, Ian, probably. That's a good Scottish name for a really cat. It's a really good Scottish name for a cat, don't you yeah, think? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, for some reason, Barney, if he, if he gets a boy cat, he wants to call it Ian. I think it's the reason is absurdity. Oh, absolutely. Ian is a great <laughs> name for a cat. Yeah, whenever we, we're watching something and there's someone called Ian on it, he'll just turn to me oh. and go, that's a cat's name. That's not a person <laughs> name. That's a cat that's name. a cat name. Although that doesn't really work in with your theory when you're a kid. Didn't you used to think that all cats were, were girls and all dogs were boys? That's quite common. Yeah. Common yeah. for a nufty. I did like pooing off bridges too, but that's another story. Oh, yeah. Pooing from great heights. That is another story. Yeah. So, yeah, um, Manuel, uh, good, good head of hair. Nice to cats. Everything else about him sucks. Um, so Michael's friend David Perrette actually had a lucky escape as he and Michael were hoping that he could stay the night at the Smarts place on the night that they were murdered. And um, we just have a clip of, of David talking about that. Well, it's, it's quite foreseeable I would have been there the night he was murdered. Murdered. I think it was either the day or two days before he was, he was murdered. Right. And I can remember being at his house and... He, he was an only child, and I had two brothers. And I often used to stay the night with him, and I remember him asking me to stay the night. And I phoned my mother to get permission, and she said no, but it wasn't convenient, as far as my mother was concerned, to stay the night. I'd been to the house after the murders had taken place and noticed that the curtains were closed. I went back later one afternoon to find the curtains were now open but there was never any reply to my ringing of the bell and knocking at the door. So my assumption was that Manuel must have been in the house when I'd gone to the house the first time. You can't have stayed at his house. <laughs> it's, not, it's not convenient. <laughs> wow, so yeah, he actually uh, knocked on the door when... Close call. Yeah, big time. Yeah. Um, so, of course, the, the community was really in quite a state of terror at this point, and the, the sale of door and window locks went up dramatically. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, this whole thing was viral marketing for locksmiths. Mm. Um, so Manuel had stolen some brand new bank notes from the Smarts that Michael had recently withdrawn from the bank, and he spent these at a local pub. Police were able to trace these notes to Michael Smart, which gave them some evidence that Manuel had been at their place and stolen them. So finally, just like a tiny bit of freaking evidence is happening. Nice. Yeah, I just feel like it's surprising he was such a slippery sucker. Uh, the police investigation has been widely criticised uh, for being a bit shit because it was possibly a bit shit. In another twist of fate, um, Manuel also stole the the, um, the Smart's car and he happened to give a lift to a police officer who was investigating the disappearance of Isabel Cook. And he told the officer that he thought police weren't looking for her in the right places. You're kind of looking for him in the wrong place, eh? <laughs> Murder. Um, so it was only after the Smarts murders that police realised or acknowledged that there was a serial killer operating in the area, which finally, fucking finally, exonerated William Watts because the poor guy has been through enough already. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, the community opinion was that he might have killed them as well. So not yeah. only did he, all the other things happen, but he was also being shunned and gossiped about. Like, fuck off. Mm. Shunned and gossiped. Yeah, it's kind of like me at work. Uh, after these murders, detectives from Glasgow were brought in to assist the local Lancashire police. On January 14th, detectives went to the Manuel's house with a warrant. And it wasn't the first time the Manuel's house had ever been searched by the cops. I think it happened pretty much every Wednesday. 
Uh, stolen items were found and Manuel and his dad were arrested for theft. Police were pretty sure Manuel was the one who had murdered the smarts, but they needed a confession to really make it stick. They put him in a cell alone for several hours to stew before trying to question him. He did not like being ignored. Um, so the longer they left the narcissistic fuck alone, the more he wanted to talk, which was their strategy. Mm. Are um, you the murderer? Aye. Aye. Just want to tell Midar about the murder. Uh, Manuel, Manuel, I did it again, Manuel, faulty towers. Manuel said he'd confess to his crimes if he was allowed to speak to his parents and if his father would be freed, as he said that his father was innocent. I wonder if you drive an automatic car. Yeah, or a manual. manual. (laughs) That's how I actually try and remember to say his name right, but the little dude from Faulty Towers keeps popping in there. Yeah, the little fucker. (laughs) (laughs) I speak English good. Um, Manuel confessed to all eight murders. The police questioned him further to find out where Isabel Cook's body was so that her family could finally bury her and hopefully get some peace. But being the self-aggrandizing control freak he was, he said he'd show them if they took him on a little field trip to go find the body. Oh, how lovely. I know, it's kind of a common one, this one. Um, so he led them around in circles a lot and, you know, played fuck buggers with them. And they'd all decided it was just a twisted game he was playing. Um, and they were about to give up when they asked him, like, once again, like, where is her body, fuck dick? And after a long, drawn-out pause, he finally replied, yeah... I think I'm standing on her now. I'm kind of standing on the wee last now then. Yeah, so he was actually standing on her body for some of that. While or the he ground was... above it. Well, yeah, the ground above it. What do you think? Or they would have saw it. Well, yeah, they probably would have seen it even. Seen it. Oh, um, fuck you. Fuck you back. Fuck you harder. <laughs> fuck you sideways with a theremin you fucked hard. hat full of assholes. Are you... You're the sound of a hat full of assholes. And it's like Lincoln's hat too, that big stovepipe one. So it's got a lot of assholes Imagine how many assholes you could fit in that hat. Yeah, well, you're a vaguely defrosted bowl of dicks. Oh, yeah, nice. still a little bit icy, really? but kind of floppy In the microwave, well. hey? That's not where you defrost your bowls of dicks. In Only the microwave, when I want do you? bits of them cooked and the other bits still You don't frozen. put them out when you go to work in the morning so they're nice and, and, and thawed out by the time you get home from work? Or you just put them in the microwave when you get home from work? Your bowl of dicks. I don't have a microwave and I generally don't work morning. So your entire fucking theory is just stupid. I think you should just get on with your story. Yeah, I think I'd like to if you'd ever shut up. Um, So at least they were able to remove Isabel's body from the field that he'd buried her in and put her to rest properly. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's like something. Um, Manuel had raped Isabel, beaten her about the head and then strangled her with her own bra. So gangster, so cool. He's a horrible man. Yeah, yeah, but he thinks he's awesome. Like, he thinks James Cagney would just, like, bow down and tell him how yeah, fucking great he was. Yeah, dangle from a rope, motherfucker. Well, it's funny you should say that. Mm. Um, anyway, one of the guards who watched over Manuel in prison was Norman Ironside, and he tells us what his impressions that of That guy that's were. in Starship Troopers. Uh, yes. That's Michael Ironside. Sure, why not? I love him. I don't even know which guy you're talking about. You don't about. know who Michael Ironside is? Well, I probably do. It rings a bell. I'll show you a picture later. Okay, this is great podcasting. Very good radio. Well, get on with it then. Well, you've got to play the fucking clip. Oh. He was a very intelligent lad. Very bright mind. Well read. Uh, But he had a super ego. Looked upon us as lesser beings, really. Felt that he was untouchable almost. I don't think he fancies him. Yeah, at, at, the, room. at the start, it, he did sound a bit like he might want to touch his butt, but then he kind of came around. <laughs> Barney's miming, squeezing milk out of his nipples and it hitting him in the eye. <laughs> it was hitting you in the eye. <laughs> so it's, it's like a little bit distracting, but also kind of awesome. Um, on May 12th, 1958, he went to court and the media were all over it. The press offered large sums of money to anyone with a story to tell about Manuel. The defence team tried to have his confession to the murders made inadmissible and 10 days into the trial, he did what any cocksure fuck knuckle would do and dismissed his defence team. Uh, he so represented he could... himself? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. The total fucking cocksure fuck knuckle move. Yeah, yeah. Um, there wasn't much physical evidence and no witnesses, so the prosecution needed the confession to stay in. Absolutely. Um, oh, other people who've done that fuck knuckle thing. Um, who do we have? We had uh, Ted Bundy, yep. um, Rodney Alkea. Um, who else has done it? There have been a few. It's pretty... Um... Oh, what's she saying? Bomb, bomb. Chick, chick, 
Tilo. No, he didn't do no, it. No, he didn't do it. No. He just waved <laughs> his dick at everyone. He just waved his dick and went, what would I do with this thing? And if you want to hear more about that, that was in the previous episode. Yes, it was indeed. Um, so the confession was really important. And I'd have another clip of journalist Russell Galbraith talking about why that is. The key moment, I think, was when Lord Cameron decided that uh, his confession could be led in evidence. It really was his own confession with the supporting evidence that, that did for him. I mean, they had the evidence, he clearly was guilty, but his confession was dynamite. A confession dynamite. Or pure dynamite. Um, so the hatful of assholes tried to say that he was innocent and put the blame for the Watt murders back on William Watt. Because, you know, William Watt hasn't had a rough enough time. Yeah, squelch back into your cell. Yeah. <laughs> that's what, that's what assholes in a hat would do. That would squelch. They would squelch. Yeah, well, it was pretty squelchy before when you did it. Too squelchy for my liking. Not um, squelchy enough for my liking. Yeah, I know you like it, squelchy theremin boy. Uh, some people say that um, Manuel shouldn't have received the death penalty um, because he was a psychopath. Um, like they said, it, he shouldn't even be eligible for it. But, you know, fuck off. Being a psychopath doesn't get you out of it. Um, not well, usually. Well, by definition of law, he's not a psychopath because he knew right from wrong. He tried to cover it up. Well, he didn't kill anyone in front of a cop, did he? No. Um, so he was seen by several doctors as well, and they all said that he was fit to stand trial. There's some other talk that epilepsy made him do it. But you know what? Fuck off. Concur. Mm-hmm. That's my legal legal opinion um so norman ironside also has, i've got another quick clip um saying that when he was guarding the hatful of assholes he didn't appear to be mentally ill at all it was just something that he was trying to use as an excuse didn't give the impression that he was ill he appeared to be a very intelligent man and he certainly would have been very annoyed if you had referred to him as having a mental problem Manuel was convicted of seven murders and the judge instructed the jury not to find him guilty of the murder of Anne Neelands. Um, as the judge said, there was insufficient, insufficient evidence to back up his confession. Um, unfortunately, though, um, Anne's friends and family, like this really um, sort of just added even... Gutted him. Yeah, yeah. like it, it just made things even worse. Um, we've got a clip of Mae McLaughlin describing how this was kind of the last straw for them in a way. Absolutely devastated because as far as we were concerned, he was guilty. And when we were told that the judge had directed the jury as not guilty for every for uh, Anne Neon's murder, we just couldn't believe it. Every other murder, he was found guilty but that one. And that was just... I think it just finished the family off. I don't think they could, they could believe that this could happen. Bad enough losing their daughter, but when a judge tells them that this monster isn't guilty, it's hard to take in. It really is. Yeah, that's pretty tough. Yeah, look, I really wish they could have got some sense of justice for Anne's death. Hmm. So, well, you know, although he wasn't uh, found guilty of her murder, he was sentenced to hang by the neck until he was dead. Mm, suck it, cockknocker. Yeah, that's pretty good, isn't it? Um, he was hanged on July 11th, 1958, and even anti-death penalty advocates were, like, totally cool with that. Yeah, we're all right with it. Yeah, you know, normally I'm thinking, like, don't kill people, but in this case, go mm, for it. Yeah. Um, so he's now buried in an unmarked grave against the west wall of Barlini Prison's D block. So that fucker's never getting out. Not even in a body bag. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Try big gangster in the wall, motherfucker. Um, a fortnight after his death, Manuel was also charged with another murder, um, believed to be his fifth murder. On December 8th, 1957, um, around that time, Manuel had gone to Newcastle looking for work. And on this trip, uh, he murdered and robbed taxi driver Sidney Dunn. Uh, Dunn's body was found on Moorlands in Northumbria, but Manuel had already gone back to Lincolnshire by this time. At the inquiry into the murder, they officially tied the crime to Manuel after a button found in the taxi after Dunn was killed was matched to a jacket of Manuel's that had um, a button missing on it. Yeah, that's yeah. some good police work there. Yeah, yeah. Look, they finally decided to put a couple of actual police on the case. And instead of just getting lifts around with the murderer, um, they uh, solved some crimes, apparently. Good. 
Yeah, so that's good. So yeah, that guy, fucking horrible. Good hair, good to cats, everything else sucks. Hmm. What a story. Yeah. Well, you know, I figured it would be interesting to look into some Scottish action. Hmm. And yeah, um, horrible time for everyone. And it's a shame, you know. Well, I guess, okay, it's a shame that the forensics... um, like science wasn't particularly developed back well, then. Well, this is in the mid fifties, right? Yeah, yeah, but I suppose it, it is more so just brilliant that it has developed to the level that it has now. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Tara, would you like to hear about the Irwin sisters? I would indeed. Um, I remember this case happening. Really struck a chord with me. Um, they lived in Melbourne as well, like we do, and there was a lot of coverage, and they yeah. they just seemed like girls who were really. You know, they were young and they were doing things they loved and they just seemed very... Yeah, they lived in Altona North, which is um, just an outer suburb of... Uh, west, outer western suburb of Melbourne. Yeah, they seemed like um, lovely young women who were really enjoying their lives until this fucker came along. Yeah, this story is about the Irwin sisters, but before we talk about them, I want to introduce you to the bad guy. Yeah, do it. Uh, a serving Victorian police officer wrote about this, and I quote... William John Watkins was a time bomb and everyone heard the fucking ticking before he picked on a blind woman less than half his size and beat her senseless in her bed. By the time he raped a woman in the sanctity of her home 18 months later, his alarm was ringing loud and clear. How any judge could sit in front of a man like Watkins and consider the sentences imposed were appropriate for what he did is beyond the comprehension of most normal people. Yeah. yeah, he's another one that he shouldn't have been out at the time that he committed these murders. He shouldn't have been out. He should have been locked up. Locked it all up. started when he was about 18. Um, there's charges there for vehicle theft, driving unlicensed, assaulting police, resisting police, criminal damage, um, drunk in a public place, uh, failing you know to when stop like, after an accident. You know, when they're fighting police back, you just know they're un- they're like off the fucking Yeah, leash. His, his rap sheet is too long to read out. Yeah. Um, his first offence was in 1985 and he continued to rack up offences for being unlawfully on premises and intentionally causing injury. In 1998, Watkins broke into the Yarraville bungalow of a legally blind invalid pensioner. The woman heard the break-in occurring and called police, returning to lay in her bed while she waited for them to arrive. The next the woman remembers is waking up in the hospital with a broken jaw and facial injuries that a doctor said could only have been caused by severe blows to the face. Wow. Uh, Watkins claimed the breakdown of his relationship that led to excessive drinking, including consuming between 20 and 30 pots that night after payday. Um, They're about 280 mils. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I've consumed at least that much. And boy, have I had some breakouts. Never made me break into the home of a blind lady and rape her. So I'm not sure I buy any of that. In 1999, after drinking at home, Watkins walked 100 metres to another home. <laughs> Lazy, isn't he? That's like a block. Uh, to another home to commit a burglary. He found the female occupant of the house asleep on the bed and sexually assaulted her. Ugh. A report indicated Watkins had a low to moderate risk of reoffending because he was taking steps to deal with his alcohol problems. Well, he was taking, what, steps 100 metres to go rape someone else and that's how he's dealing with his fucking offending? Are you kidding me? So Watkins got six years, but he was allowed to serve sentences for both crimes um, at the same time, slashing his time behind bars. He was out in two years. Why the hell? He is clearly a fucking predator. He's even happy to attack people in his own neighbourhood. Um, and whatever he's doing to stop this happening clearly isn't working. This is crazy. It's a travesty. It really is. When he was paroled, he moved into a rented flat next next to the Irwin sisters in Alterna right. North. Mm-hmm. Alterna North. The girls were netballers, hard workers, and successful in their young careers. Colleen, 23, 23 was described as a talented photographer who worked at a camera store in Melbourne. Laura, 21, is a graphic artist with Channel 10, and an aspiring filmmaker. Um, One of the highlights for her was when TV celebrity Burt Newton introduced her to world-famous cricketer Brett Lee. Oh, she got to work with Burt Newton. I know. The sisters loved a night out and would dance until the early hours. Other nights, the girls and their friends would watch movies and pig out on chocolate. Yeah, well, they were country girls, weren't they? So they must have been really excited to move to the city, get to live together and, like, do what they yeah, wanted. Yeah, apparently they dreams. were best friends, these sisters, only being a couple of years apart and, you know, moving out of home and living together. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, they were both well-educated and, you know. 
Yeah. Friends of Colleen and Laura Irwin told of the pair's kindness, wisdom, and their love of life. Now, back to Watkins. Yeah. He was um, a fat 270 pounds. What, as opposed to what a muscular, I suppose. The yeah. rock's probably pretty heavy. He was heavy. 6'2", and he lived in a ground floor unit next door um, to the house, rented by the sisters. He's got to be the laziest criminal I've ever heard of. He doesn't even go more than a block to get his shit done, does he? No. It is not known if he knew the young women, but at least some of the neighbours felt comfortable having him around, which is weird. Why? Um, he was a private guy who kept his blinds drawn, said Michael and Jenna, who lived um, in the flats. While we were living there, he we felt safe having a tap. We what? felt we felt safe having a tough-looking guy living next door. It's very strange to imagine what he was capable of. Well, they probably felt safe having a tough-looking guy live next door because they thought that he would probably go somewhere else to commit any crimes that he was going to do, rather than just I don't know go next door to do it. That's right. In January 2006, uh, Colleen Irwin, 23, was like any other proud young woman when she called her mother on Friday night to report a promotion at work. Oh. Um, Colin made the call from her job at Ted's Camera. Ted's Cameras in the city. You know that, that yeah, place? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, what's that? Elizabeth Street. Yeah. An hour later at 8pm, her sister Laura, 21, a graphic artist at Channel 10, also spoke to her mother, Shirley, who was at home um, in Tulamba near Shepparton. That's in central Victoria. It's a country town. So they sound like a pretty close family. Yeah. Their mother never spoke to them again, and exactly what happened over the next 24 hours is a mystery. Although a triple O emergency call was made from Laura's mobile at 1.44am on January 28th, um, but the operator heard a short, indecipherable sound before the call ended, and no emergency services were dispatched. Right, they thought it was a butt dial. Yeah, it was actually because their throat was cut. Oh, f- Friends arrived at the Miller's Road house the next evening to pick up the sisters for a Saturday night out, but no one answered the door. The friends called Mrs. Mrs. Irwin to see if she knew where her daughters were. She didn't. About 9pm that evening, another friend let herself into the woman's home with a spare key and discovered their bodies in an upstairs bedroom. They had been stabbed to death. At 3am on Sunday, police arrived at Shirley and Alan Irwin's home to break the news. That's her parents. Yes. Oh, that's got to be the most unpleasant 3am anyone's ever had. Oh, absolutely. It wasn't long before Victoria Police issued a statewide alert for officers to keep a lookout for Watkins. It outlined that he had a history of violence and should be treated with caution. Um, but by then he was driving hard for the other side of the country. Mm-hmm. Both sisters had been raped and were stabbed to death and their bodies discovered side by side on a bed where when a friend investigated Mm, there was a lot more discovery. description of what happened, but I didn't really want to go into that, to tell you the truth. Yeah. What Dumb, can, do you know, did they die at the same time-ish? Uh, no, one, one, one first and another got home. Oh, right. Yeah. Sorry, that's right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Watkins travelled um, nearly 3,000 miles in a, in a cross-continental dash to avoid the cops, the jacks. The Popo. Oh, the Popo, that's right, because we're American. I loved a two cent song. Dressed in a red shirt, dark cap and sunglasses, with tattoos down his arms, he pulled into the roadhouse on a northwest coastal highway about 60 miles south of Caratha at about 9.40 a.m. And that's WA, is yeah. it? Yeah. Pumping $80 worth of uh, petrol into his white Toyota station wagon. And then he took off without paying. Uh, that's really clever, because you're on the lam from the cops for being a rapey killy fuck and what we'll just do some like fucking pump and run i'll get away with that well it was a stupid decision tara one of the ver- one of the very many stupid decisions in william john Watkins' brutal predatory life yeah stupid brutal predatory the female attendant at the roadhouse watched as he sped up um sped off to the north i've worked here for three and a half years and you don't get many people who don't pay up she said wow she's got a manly voice but he hopped back in and took off like a rocket <laughs> Uh, she told her boss, who said, ring the, ring, ring the cops. Ring the coppers. Yeah, ring the cops, Deirdre. Um, <laughs> I don't know if her name is Deirdre. Uh, he shouldn't have been hard to find. There's only one road. <laughs> There's only one road. That's my favourite line. Yeah. Acting Sergeant Shane Gray headed out from the uh, Caratha Police Station to intercept him. At 10.28 a.m., he pulled him over on, on the highway um, just south of town and radioed back to headquarters for a name check. What happened next uh, is a little bit sketchy. Yeah, sketchy how? Did you draw it? 
Uh, a couple of minutes later, Sergeant Gray radioed again, requesting backup. A second vehicle, a van with two officers, was dispatched. At 10.35 a.m., Sergeant Gray radioed a third time. Not once, not twice, but thrice. Thrice? Uh, requesting an ambulance. Right. When the other officers arrived, they found Sergeant Gray with serious enju- head injuries and 38-year-old Watkins dead from a bullet wound. Ah, oh, too bad. So sad, Watkins. It seems Watkins came out of his car with a wheel brace and hit the policeman oh, in the face, breaking his nose and fracturing his skull. Oh. Sergeant Gray got off two shots, one of which hit Watkins in the upper chest. When the attendant at the roadhouse heard the man had been killed, she felt a terrible sense of guilt. Well, nah. initially. Don't worry um, about it, love. You're I right. I thought if I rung the police, he would still be alive, uh, she said. It was running through my mind that night. I feel like you're going British. I feel like you're like uh, that guy sorry. in Wisnell and I who goes, hair are your aerials. Now I feel absolutely horrified at what he's supposed to have done. <laughs> she shouldn't be British. I am relieved that he didn't come anywhere near me. I've made a doll what wets itself. Uh, yeah. So um, she was glad that uh, she right. So initially, she felt him. really bad because she thought it was her fault somehow. Yeah. But the guy, even if he hadn't, um, you know, done all the other horrible things he did, he whacked a cop in the face with a tire iron. I mean, you know, he's asking for it. About six hundred mourners gathered to farewell the girls at a community hall in her hometown of Tulamba near Shepparton in northern Victoria. Um, Megan Kelly and her sister Leanne, that was for friends of the girls, mm-hmm. told of their friendship with the sisters. Formals, debutant balls, boyfriends and breakups. Finishing high school, moving out. Megan read a letter by by Kelly to Coles. They That's what they Coles. called her, yeah. Colleen. We watched each other grow into, into the women we dreamed of being. Of Laura, she said, uh, you always surprised me with your endless wisdom, which was far beyond your years. They sound like lovely women, don't they? Yeah, lovely yeah. Young women. Um, during the service, paramedics were called to treat two people who had collapsed in the hall. Aww. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, all of these murders that we talk about, it's obviously terrible for the people who lose their lives, but just the, the like ripple effect to everyone else that it also devastates and the Absolutely. other lives that it ruins is um, just impossible to even quantify. The sisters were buried at Tulamba Cemetery. Tulamba has fewer than 100 households and promotes itself with the slogan, Little Town, Big Heart. On February 4th, 2006, it's Big Heart wept. Aww. Following an inquest into the uh, sisters' murders, um, Ellen and Shirley Irwin praised the police but said the justice system had let them down. Um, This is what they said about the inquest. Uh, What has happened is he tells us exactly what we already knew and the only thing I wanted to hear was why he, Watkins, was out of jail. And he he, he just couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, It's the biggest waste of our time because it just told us what we already knew. Wow. Mr. Irwin said doctors had told the parole board Watkins was a moderate danger to the community. Moderate my fucking ass. Uh, Crime Victims Support Association President Noel Mac- McNamara said it was outrageous Watkins was uh, not still in jail when he killed the Irwin sisters. We believe there should be an independent royal commission into this, how it happened, why this man was uh, let go free and why, and nothing has been done about it since. Mrs. Irwin said the coroner's findings had not given her any closure and time only intensified her grief. Every day that goes past, you miss them more, she said. Mm, wow. Okay. Were they the only children as well? Yeah. Yeah, right. So it's both of her babies. Okay. In August 2014, WA police gifted a pair of handcuffs, a police handcuffs, to the parents of Colleen and Laura. In a, in a move that is believed to be a West Australian first, senior police granted permission for Victorian couple Shirley and Alan Irwin to be given the handcuffs, a symbolic token the couple say represents their bond with the policeman who shot dead their daughter's killer. Uh-huh. Uh, since 2006, the Irwins have forged a close bond with Sergeant Gray and his family, ever thankful that he spared them the heartache and stress of a protracted court trial. They also share a special friendship with another uh, police officer, John Groves, who assisted Sergeant Gray in the aftermath of the shooting. Um, WA police make provisions for retiring police officers to keep their equipment and accoutrements. I like that word. Mm, it's a accoutrements. Nice word. Including uh, the baton and handcuffs. But this is believed to be the first special dispensation has been granted for police equipment to be presented to someone outside the force. The handcuffs, which were carried by Sergeant Gray, 
on the fate on that fateful day in 2006 had been mounted in a frame and a, with a plaque engraved two families forever linked in love and support wow and so um the Irwins have that at their place yeah wow it's amazing how um, some of these absolutely appalling crimes sort of bring people together in their survival. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So, Tara. Yes, Barney? I was um, listening to this BBC um, history uh, podcast the other day, and they were talking about World War One. Yeah. And uh, the presenter was saying, he's just written this thesis on it, he was saying that, you know, although war is hell and that's well reported, Mm-hmm. He was also talking about the paradox of war and how a lot of returning service people say that it's also some of the best times of their lives, the best time of their lives. Well, yeah, I've seen MASH. Yeah, because of the camaraderie and the friendships and um, just they have this singular purpose. Yeah. Are you drawing some kind of bow here? I'm, I'm, tr- I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I, look, it reminds me of why we do this, and it's not about glorifying these horrible criminals. It's it's actually raising up, you know, law enforcement and... Survivors. The, the, and survivors and victims' families... Yeah. ...that really have to, you know, pull it together. And well, they can yeah, rise yeah. Above it. If we're trying to glorify anyone, it's them. I also really enjoy denigrating absolute fucking narcissistic asshole murderers. But yeah, there are a lot of heroes in a lot of the stories that we tell. Yeah, um, and, and you know what? Sometimes there isn't too. You know, well, there's, sometimes they just can't be. No, there's survivors and these victims' families. You know, they'll become alcoholics and die young of liver failure or whatever because they've just they just can't handle it. It's well, awful. yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, I, I know there's um, there are some services available, but I, I I certainly couldn't deign to say whether or not they are satisfactory for the victims of, of families. In fact, we were talking like we do want to uh, donate to victims' family charities when we actually have enough money to do any donating. But it's something that we've always wanted to do. Yeah. Um, once we get to a point where we're able to, because um, that's that's where some really uh, difficult uh, recovering needs to happen. So we'd like to be helping that. Hey, we're all in this together. I mean, you know, the human race. Yeah, you know, yeah. Humanity, well, a we're lot all of in us, this together. A lot of us are in this together. Then there's some people oh. who are just trying to fuck with all of us. But, Let's yeah. try and do the right thing. Yeah, completely. Speaking of the right thing, Tara. Uh-huh, Bonnie. Um, do you like magic? Um, I like Job from Arrested Development and his shitty magic. Do you like rabbits? Uh, rabbits are pretty cool. I like that Muhammad Ali was really into magic tricks. I think that kind of thrills me slightly. I do a little bit of sleight of hand with my kids kind of thing. What, just like giving them the finger? Well, the, the other, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only one I've seen you The do. other day I pulled out a can of soda from behind my, uh, my son Mo's ear. You know, I just had it hidden in my hand. I said, would you like this can of Fanta? And he went, and, and, and Dexter, my nine-year-old son, my other son, he saw that and he just went, Daddy, how did you do that? <laughs> Dexy I, thought it was real. And I said, magic, magic, of course. And he said, no, no, seriously. Yeah, Dad, you're not magic. You have to tell me how you did that. And I said, I can't. I, it's a magician will never reveal his tricks. Yeah, well, you're not allowed. Are you allowed to reveal them to other magicians? Well, What's the rules with magicians? Well, I, I will tell you more about that. Ooh, okay, cool. Now, rabbits. I know this is all going to come together. It's very yeah, soon. Yeah, you know that because I'm not sure. There was a rabbit in my front yard the other day. I know you're saying. Yeah, I find that difficult to believe. Just munching on our vegetables. That's very difficult to believe, Barney. This is what my my 12 year old son Mo told me, and I just went bullshit. You're making yeah. it up. Um, but he See, said, "You treat your son the way I treat you. Like, nah. Unless I know about it existing, I think it's probably bullshit." Well, he had he he videotaped it. With, mm. his, with his phone and he showed me. So he's not the boy who cried rabbit. There was a white rabbit in my front garden, just wild. Wow. I know people are going, so what? Well, well, big we, fucking, don't, we don't get a lot of white bunnies in our yards big, in Big fucking deal. We live in the middle, middle of inner city Melbourne, mm. you know. You don't really get that much wildlife. Well, you get possums Heaps and stuff, possums, but no but rabbits. And spiders, rabbit. my house, obviously. Anyway, this white rabbit looked like it just jumped out of a, a top hat, a magician's A top, top hat, hat full of assholes? And I thought, well, maybe I can... I can find out if a magician, a local magician, has lost his rabbit. <laughs> so I went on the interwebs. Your mind works in mysterious ways. So I mind. went in the interwebs and I couldn't find anything. But what I did find out mm. is you cannot have a pet rabbit in Queensland. You can't? No, because they're pests. 
Can you have a pet cane toad? They're pests too. Yeah, no, you can't. You can't. Have a pet. Well, you wouldn't really want one. You but, know, I actually had a, pe- a cane toad that lived in my room for ages. What happened was um, my sadistic older brother, for fun, threw a cane toad through my bedroom window. And then it was in my room and it would like hop around and I didn't want to touch it because they freaked me out because I was like Don't they have little poison girl. glands under their yeah, legs yeah, or something? Yeah, yeah, they totally have poison glands. Um, but yeah, so that toad like lived in my bedroom for a while, like hiding under stuff. And he Was just, that your first boyfriend? Um, <laughs> the first guy I made out with. Well, it was, wasn't your first boyfriend, but it was one of your boyfriends. Are you implying that I was a child slut and then slut shaming me for it? I wouldn't do that. No, you'd probably applaud it. No, I just thought, yeah, I had a cane toad that lived in my room for a while. I just thought that just, it, it just, I remembered. Would you like to hear more about rabbits? Yeah, in I Queensland? think it's more attractive than someone that has a cane toad in their bedroom. Okay, so you, you can't have a pet rabbit in Queensland, right? Okay, We've sure. established this, but there is an exception. What is the loophole? If you're a member of the Magician's Guild. I, I saw this coming. <laughs> and I thought, this is pretty cool. Yeah, because you just want to move to Queensland and become a magician now. Is this what's happening? Sounds like a plan. What does? There are only 34 registered magicians in Queensland that own rabbits. Are registered magicians like registered sex offenders? No, you just, well, you have to join the Magician's Guild. And I thought, you sure, I'm going to join the Magician's Guild. How hard could it be? I found out what you have to do. What do you have to do? Well, you have to go to a few meetings, befriend another member, and he will then sponsor you. Oh, so it's like AA? Yeah, kind of. Oh, yeah. Okay. Pro- but probably with more drinking. Or less um, drinking. Or less drinking. Um, yeah, get someone to sponsor you and go to a few more meetings and then you have to put on a performance. Now, that didn't ex- actually say what you have to do in the performance. Could you just like lip sync for your life? Probably saw a woman in half or something oh, like that. Oh, that woman must get so sick of being And then if the, if, if the performance is good enough, they'll let you into the guild and, you'll, and um, then there's a ceremony, <laughs> a secret ceremony... <laughs> Oh, where they all wear like hoods and masks and it's eyes wide shut all over again, I right? suspect it's something like that mm-hmm. and there's a, some kind of initiation kind of thing. Oh, they probably like cut you and make you rub blood with everyone else. That's what they did to me. Oh, whoops, no, sorry, not a member. And after that, you get your card for the Magician's Guild and you have access to their library. Ooh. Now, that's a big deal because that's where all the, the secrets are. Secrets of the world, Tara. Okay, there's probably just a few like Goosebumps books and like a, a fucking Houdini autobiography. No, now, biography. If you want to understand how the world works, you're going to have to get into that library. How do you even know what's in the library? I don't it know. It might be a really shit library. You don't know this. I don't know, but I suspect. I just have a couple of all like. All of the answers to my, my questions. A couple are of in Paul that Reiser's book, Parenthood or Familyhood or Husbandhood or whatever they're called. Hey, um. I had all this other stuff about magicians and, and magician deaths yeah. that I was going to read, but I think I'm going to save it for the Patreon-only episode. Okay. Which also has, um, a, we'll have a story about a Russian uh, wizard who killed some models. <gasps> a Russian wizard who killed models? And the last woman that was hung in uh, Czechoslovakia. Yes. And the last woman that was hung in Britain. And we're going to have a lot of killer ladies so, and a lot of magic. We're not, I'm not going to beg you for money. You don't have to. You can no, listen to us for free. That's but if fine. you want to listen to those episodes, you know. If you want some li- extra as much, content. As little as a dollar. Yep. Oh, also, if, you, um, if you're on a $5 a month level or up, you actually get to pick a case and have us cover it. I'm currently working on Charlie Starkweather. Char- Charlie Starkweather for Jim. Um, hopefully be able to record that next week. I, I want to do it justice, though, and it's kind of complicated. Um, so, yeah, feel free to um, become a patron if you would like to have access to magician tales and all kinds of stuff. Now, Tara, I think it's definitely time for an Aussie Az, don't oh, you? Oh, absolutely. Um, so, Aussie Az, these are tales of stupidity with a quintessentially Australian flavour. Um, thanks to Susan, I'm actually looking more into some of these Darwin Award ones because mm, nice Aust- one, Susan. Yeah, Australia is really representing at the Darwin Awards. So the Spring Nationals, also known as Spring Nats, is a country car festival in Shepparton, and it's a drunken bogan celebration of cars and titties. Um, picture hundreds of drunk car crazed fuck knuckles many in stupid hats yelling show us your tits show us your tits love show us your fucking norks to any woman naive or unfortunate enough to attend this white trash bonanza or even you know happen nearby uh, sounds like my worst them. nightmare yeah it does it does all uh, those men undressing me with their eyes <laughs> yeah. and their hands 
<laughs> and their tongues. And their feet. Um, on November 25th, 2000. Oh, no. Undressing you with their cocks? <laughs> wow. That's, that's an image. Uh, with their defrosted cocks. That's Partially right. Partially Well, not in the cocks. microwave because I remember to put them out before I went to work. Well, that's very clever of you. Everyone wants a piece of your milkshake. Um, so uh, on November 25th, 2000, a truck drove noisily down Main Street at a slow pace of five miles per hour. Um, it was minding its own business. It wasn't part of summer gnats or spring gnats in this case. Um, it was just trying to avoid killing all the drunk people that were frolicking and climbing all over it. Um, the sight of the slow-moving truck gave a visitor from Cranbourne a brilliant idea. He decided to surf along behind it. Woo! Oh. What could possibly go wrong? Nice burp, Bogan. Thanks. Um, so all decked out in a huge sombrero, with a can of beer in one hand and a rope that he attached to the back of the truck in the other, he slid along the surface of the road on a piece of cardboard having a wonderful time show us your tits I'm thinking of that picture that I used as a profile shot of Ernest, Ernest Borgnine water skiing water skiing yes I was thinking of that too actually oh, yeah. so it's kind of like that with a little bit more show us your norks love um, so he was having a really good time you know Borgnining it up um, that is until the rope caught beneath the truck and he was pulled under the wheels he got splushed splushed massively splushed and smushed. Um, as if becoming a human speed hump wasn't amusing enough, the photo on the front page of the local newspaper showed um, his body, like he sh- like a body bag, and next to it was this like gigantic multicoloured sombrero that he'd been wearing. <laughs> uh, let's just hope he wasn't able to have children before that happened. Oh, no, because like, kids are just like, that's how daddy died. No, because that's, you know that's the Darwin Award thing. Oh, you know? right, because he's going to keep the stupid, stupid genes alive. That's right. Uh huh. Show us your tits. It's too late for me though. I've yeah. got kids. You've got a couple. You got boys, and they probably got dumb sperm like you. <laughs> Is that what we're saying? <laughs> I can't believe I just said your kids have dumb sperm. That's like one of the worst things I've said all day. You told me once that my sperm were gay. <laughs> I'm not gay, but my sperm are. Well, look, I'm sure in whatever that context... That doesn't even make sense. I'm sure whatever context that was, it was A, drunken, and B, entirely appropriate, even though I can't imagine what kind of context that could be Thank right you, now. Thank you, Dr. Tara. You're welcome. That's a good Aussie ass. <laughs> yeah, it certainly didn't end well for poor Sombrero Man. Uh, so I reckon that's about it for us. Yeah, I would say that is another episode of... Bloody Murder. I've been Barney Black. And I've been Tara Saraban. And we just did some Bloody Murder. Please don't forget to review us on iTunes. And of course, rate and subscribe. It really helps us grow. Um, you can join our Facebook group, Bloody Murder Podcast. Where you will get see to see pictures of all elephant the people. Elephant titties. Of elephant titties. Oh, and, and also of the people involved in the cases that we talk about. I forgot about that bit. Yeah. It's kind of become so much more than that now. Um, we'll put up that Ernest Borgnine picture. <laughs> oh, fuck yeah. That was your profile mm. shot for a while, wasn't it? It was. <laughs> um, follow us on Twitter and Tumblr and all those things. Yeah, you can so find those in the notes of the show, ah, those links. clever boy. Um, so uh, that was to Barney for putting them in the notes of the links um so thank you very much for listening and we'll be back again next week um yeah and don't forget to look at our merch that's also in the show notes yeah uh, there's you some can cool stuff. get stuff with my head on it which is the most bizarre thing i think may have ever happened to me i'm gonna get it <laughs> i'm gonna get a, a get my get your hands off my dirty pillows um shower curtain <laughs> uh, goodbye and adios and keep kicking against the pricks what if you're the prick? <laughs> well, then you should get your hands off my dirty pillows. Get your hands off my milk sweaty. Get your Elf fucking titties. hands off my dirty pillows. <laughs> I know that. You're a fuck up. on my head since 1997.